Okay, class, welcome back. Today we're going to continue our unit on molecular structure and talk about bulk scale properties. Our objective for today is to be able to determine what bulk scale properties are and how they affect molecular structure. In saying that, let's dive into what we got today. Well, the first thing we're going to talk about is what exactly is bulk scale? Well, anytime we're talking about something in bulk, we're thinking a lot of it. So whether you're buying toilet paper and hoarding that up, or you're talking about some other item, we're talking about a lot of something. This is the same in chemistry. So when we're talking about bulk scale properties, these are properties that are affected by a lot of, we'll say atoms. The only kicker is, or the only caveat in this aspect is, in chemistry, because we study stuff that's really small, a bulk scale or a lot of, some, of an atom it will probably not look like a lot typically. It's relative. For example, 12 grams of carbon is not a lot. We don't think 12 grams of something is a lot. But in reality, if we have 12 grams of pure carbon and they're uh, combined together, then that's around 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd power of carbon atoms. So there's that many carbon atoms. I can't even say that number uh, without putting it in scientific notation. That's how many atoms there are of it. As stated earlier, bulk scale properties are properties uh, that are affected by the quantity of inter or intramolecular forces. In this class, we're going to talk about five types of bulk scale properties. Melting point, boiling point, vapor pressure, um, surface tension, and conductivity. All these properties can vary in their strengths from atom to atom or from molecule to molecule. And the more molecules and the more forces we have interacting with each other, that's going to create a stronger property which is exhibited. So if we look back at our last lecture, we talked about intramolecular forces. Intramolecular forces are forces of attraction or repulsion of molecules or multiple atoms attracting or repulsing each other. We talked about how opposite charges attract each other and the, the quantity of those opposite charges create a quantity of strength or makes it stronger or weaker. So if I have one positive and one negative charge, that's gonna be weaker than if I have three positive and three negative charges. Okay, so we talked about opposites attracting, uh, like charges are gonna repel, quantity makes a difference. So how this applies to bulk scale properties is the quantity of which these atoms occur, the bulk of these molecules coming together, uh, are going to make bonds. The stronger those bonds are, the more or the, the more they're going to resist a change in state. This increase in energy also increases the bulk, the point of bulk scale properties to be observed. For example, a cup of water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. While let's just take a cup, same measurement of rubbing alcohol, that's going to boil at only 80 degrees Celsius. Well, why does one boil at 100 and one boil at 80? Well, because the intramolecular forces in the water are stronger attached to each other and more, there's more quantity of them. Even though we have one cup, that at those atoms, those uh, charges and intramolecular forces are stronger. Because they are stronger, they're going to be harder to break and it's going to take more energy to break them. Because it takes more energy to break them, it's going to have to be a higher temperature. So the reason it takes more temperature or it's a higher temperature to boil one cup of water versus one cup of rubbing alcohol or isopropyl alcohol is because the intramolecular forces, there's more intramolecular forces in our water than there is in our isopropyl alcohol or rubbing alcohol. Now that we have this basic understanding of how intramolecular forces affect bulk scale properties, we can talk about the specific properties. Melting point is our first one. The melting point of a substance is the temperature and pressure in which a solid becomes a liquid. This occurs when the kinetic energy of an atom breaks away from the tight, rigid structure of the solid state. If we remember back to our unit on matter and when we talked about phase changes, we remember that solids have a very tight and rigid structure. But despite having a tight and rigid structure and they appear to not be moving, atoms within that solid are constantly vibrating back and forth. Though it is a minuscule amount and a small amount, they are constantly moving. So what happens here is these bonds between these atoms are so tight, it prevents them from 
breaking away from each other or moving up, that gives the solid its rigid structure. But what happens is in melting point is there's kinetic energy added. The higher the temperature goes, the more kinetic energy added to those bonds. Eventually those bonds break away. Because of this, uh, it's becoming a liquid as opposed to the tight rigid structure of a solid. So we can reason here and we can think here, okay, so melting point is the ability from a solid to become a liquid, that point. Basically that's the measurement of energy to loosen or break down a bond so that it, the solid is no longer tightly bound. The atoms of a solid is no longer tightly bound to the, each other. Well then we can reason is the higher the melting point, that means more energy is required to loosen or break those bonds. That means it's gonna take more energy to loosen or break those bonds. So we can assume that because it takes more energy to loosen or break those bonds, that means they're gonna have stronger intramolecular forces or forces holding them together. Boiling point is our next bulk scale property. And boiling point is the point in which liquids become a gas. So just like on our melting point where uh, we went from solid to liquid, now we're going from liquid to gas. If we remember back, our liquids have loose structure, but they're still bound together. What's happening here is, though, though these atoms are loosely bound together to form a liquid, uh, energy is added to those bonds, eventually those bonds are broken, and that atom is free from binding to itself or binding to other atoms. Because of that, it forms a liquid. So we can assume a higher boiling point means the stronger these atoms are attached to each other, there were stronger, stronger intramolecular forces. So if we go back to our cup of water and cup of rubbing alcohol, our water had a 100 degree boiling point while our 100 degree Celsius boiling point and our rubbing alcohol had an 80 degree Celsius boiling point. It's safe to assume that the intramolecular forces in the water because it has a higher boiling point uh, are stronger than the intramolecular forces in the rubbing alcohol because the rubbing alcohol has a lower boiling point. Otherwise, it's going to take less energy to break the bonds of the liquid molecules to form a gas molecule. Our third bulk scale property is vapor pressure. All liquids or solids have a tendency to evaporate or sublimate, which means they turn into gases. While all gases have a tendency to condensate and turn into a liquid, or go through deposition and turn into a solid. Uh, we can think of this more in a terms of equilibrium. Equilibrium is when two opposing changes go through at the same rate. In other words, uh, we don't see a net change in anything. So uh, what's occurring here is the amount of solid turning into gas or liquid turning into gas is at the same rate as gas turning into solid or gas turning into liquid. So though there is changes occurring and stuff's turning to solids, stuff's turning to liquids, stuff turning to gases, we don't see that change because it's all happening at the same rate. So if one gram turns to a, a one gram of a solid turns into a gas in one minute, then also for it to be in equilibrium, one gram of gas is gonna turn into one gram of solid within that same time limit. So we don't see a net change. A common example of this is rubbing alcohol. So we just evidently like going into isopropyl alcohol. If I have a bottle of rubbing alcohol, closed off bottle, it's sealed, it's all good. Okay, there's no external forces. That rubbing alcohol is going to evaporate. And as it evaporates uh, and turns in from a liquid to a gas, the remaining gas in that bottle turns from a gas to a liquid and they're just gonna be going back and forth at the same rate. That's why we don't have our bottle exploding because there's too much gas in it. With this understanding, we could talk about equilibrium vapor pressure. Equilibrium vapor pressure is exerted by vapors in equilibrium. Go figure. And this pressure is measured by the forces exerted on the wall to the container. So if we go back to our isopropyl alcohol in its bottle, it would be the measure of the forces of the gas on the sides of the bottle. With vapor pressure in general, the higher the pressure exerted on the substance, the more strain it will have on the substance's bond. So for example, if we climb in our elevation, uh, we go to something higher than just where we're at now. So if we were at sea level, okay, 
right close to the ocean at sea level, a cup of water is gonna have a higher boiling point than if we go on top of a mountain. Why? Because that pressure of being at a higher altitude, the pressure of all the molecules, and whether it's in the bottle of water or in the water we have or around it, uh, the pressure of those molecules are gonna be greater because we're in a higher elevation. That's gonna put more strain on the bonds. That means it's gonna lower the temperature in which it takes for those bonds to change from a liquid to a gas or from a solid to a liquid. What we're getting out of this is vapor pressure kind of pairs with other properties to affect them. So we can increase boiling point, decrease boiling point, add more strain onto the bonds with different pressures. Okay, our next bulk scale property we're gonna talk about is surface tension. Surface tension is a property found in all liquids and it is the force that pulls adjacent parts of liquid surfaces together and decreases the amount of surface area or total surface area a liquid has. The higher the attractive forces of the liquid particles, the higher the surface tension of the liquid. Okay, so we can think of this as like a drop of water. When we get water and we drop it out of a dropper, we just have a drop of water going, it forms that nice little semi-spherical shape. Well, the reason it does that opposed to just falling flat or coming out flat is because that water has attractive forces. All the surface area attracts it to itself, thus making that drop form or a closed off form. Let's think of it this way. The higher the surface tension, of a liquid, the less likely something's gonna sink in it because it's not gonna let it through that first surface. This is why lily pads uh, can float on top of water because the gravity exerted on the lily pad, okay, to hold the lily pad down, is less than the forces, the opposing forces of the surface tension on the lily pad. So there's less gravity pushing that lily pad down than there is surface tension of the water resisting that push down. Capillary action is another form of surface tension and it is where the attraction of liquid water to a surface or to the surrounding surfaces. This is why we have when we get a drink of water or something there's that curve that goes into it like we get a glass of water and we can see that water climbs up on the sides but there's a curve or a meniscus in it. This is what capillary action is. The best example of capillary action is if you get a drink of water or a drink of anything at a restaurant, okay, and they put a straw in it. Well, once that straw goes in that drink, you can see that the level of the drink inside the straw is higher than the level of the drink inside the uh, cup. Why is that? Well, the liquid in the straw is attracted to the sides of the straw, the solid sides of the straw, and it brings it up and those forces hold it up into the straw so we can see that there's two different levels there's the level of the drink and the level of the straw the liquid within the straw our final bulk scale property is conductivity conductivity is the degree in which a specific substance can conduct electricity through it uh, electrical currents must have a positive and negative terminal to go through so typically metals want to give up an electron making them positively charged ions and making just different ions so if they're giving up an electron that means something's taken on an electron so it makes it a positive terminal and a negative terminal ions within these substances that are formed create a pathway in which electric currents can pass through the more cations and the more anions present, the more positive charges and more negative charges present, this is just going back to our intramolecular forces, uh, the stronger the electrical bonds, the more electrical current that can go through it, the more conductive it is, but also the stronger the molecular bond or substance is. So the more electrical current we can pour into a substance without it breaking apart, uh, the more intramolecular forces there are, thus that means the stronger molecular structure there is. So why is bulk scale properties important? Well, bulk scale properties determine how strong a substance is or how likely a molecular structure is going to be able to go through certain changes. For example, if we need something that conducts electricity well through a house, we're obviously going to choose a metal like copper because it's going to more have a higher conductivity point or have a higher ability to conduct electricity because it's more likely to form them ions. Or if we want to make a pharmaceutical medicine, we want something that's gonna interact with a specific protein. This means when it goes in your body, it needs to have strong intra and intermolecular forces so it holds together and doesn't react with 
something it's not supposed to. It needs to be able to withhold or withstand its chemical form, uh, chemical form while it's in your stomach and while it's being digested and while it's being put through your bloodstream and all your different parts of your body um, until it reaches whatever it's supposed to neutralize or whatever protein it's supposed to go and affect. So in order to have a good pharmaceutical or a good pill med medicine, it needs to have a specific uh, bulk, it needs to have specific bulk scale properties of the molecules in which uh, it's being affected or it's affecting. Otherwise, that pharmaceutical won't be very effective at all because it will break apart before it even gets to the virus or to the um, bacteria or to whatever it is, the recept protein receptor that it's trying to get to. And saying that, that's all I got with bulk scale properties. So overall, these are just telling you how uh, molecules interact with each other and, and uh, how strongly they can hold together and what those forces are that are holding them together. I uh, hope this helped you out and good luck in what you're doing and good luck in the classroom and keep up the good work. See ya.